Hi, what's up guys? Dr. Antonio Webb here, orthopedic spine surgeon here in San Antonio, Texas. Make sure you like, subscribe, and also hit the bell notification so you don't miss any new content that we put out. In this video, we're going to be reacting to a video that was put out by the BBC. Uh, it's 11 hour spinal surgery to save a patient from paralysis. I'm gonna give my thoughts as a spine surgeon, kind of explain some of the things that are going on in the video, and I'd love to hear what you guys think also. So make sure you put it in the comments. Let's check it out. From the start, I've never thought there is a choice of not having the operation, because I know that I'm gonna be paralyzed anyway. So it, it's, it's a sort of a catch 22. So a slip disc is when a portion of your cushion spits out and presses on the nerves. And it was really interesting to hear him say that he thought that he would be paralyzed anyway. So this is a really, can be a really complex uh, condition and surgery and can cause paralysis. And that's one of the risks of our jobs as spine surgeons. Uh, one of the things that can go wrong, one of the complications is paralysis. I've noticed a few things had changed and noticed that my right thigh was half the size of my left thigh. I used to sort of describe myself as fit for my age or very fit for my age too. The medical term for that is called atrophy. This is when a part of your muscle, part of your body decreases in size. This is usually because of some type of uh, de-innervation the nerve supply that is being applied to this area has been blocked off by something. In this case, it's the disc herniation. So that if there's a disc herniation that's pushing on the nerves, a patient can present with weakness, they can present with pain, they can present with a late sign, which is atrophy, which is the muscle kind of wasting and shrinking in size. I'm sort of disabled now, right? I can't, I can't do very much. And I don't do very much, I don't pick my grandchildren up in case I fall over. So. <laughs> Which is one of the worst things. <laughs> All surgeons need to be obsessive. Neurosurgeons are perhaps more obsessive than others because there is no such thing as a, a straightforward spine operation. I 100% agree with him. Every patient is different. You can have the same um, medical problem, disc herniation in two different patients. You get into surgery and it's two totally separate surgery just because of the anatomy, how things are kind of, um, you know, inside of the body, the different structures. Um, each individual patient is different. No patient is made the same. There is no such thing as a, a straightforward spine operation. The disc is the fibrous tissue that lies between adjacent vertebrae. Occasionally, some of that disc material can break out and it can find itself pressing on the spinal cord. So what we're looking at here is a MRI image or sagittal view of the thoracic spine and it shows severe spinal cord compression. You can see some of the disc has pushed out and is pushing on his spinal cord and that's the reason why he's having pain, he's having weakness and atrophy as well as about to undergo this operation here. These are really delicate operations, and very high risk operations. This is not a procedure that we commonly do in spine surgery, but it is one that is in our tool bag. That's something that um, we could possibly have to do on the patient if they have a condition like this. Uh, this is a procedure where we go on the side of your spine and at the side of your spine, you have your rib cage, you have your lungs, you have a lot of important structures, including your blood vessels. So those structures have to be moved out of the way before we can get to the spine. The thoracic disc prolapse itself is tiny. So, uh, suction left. And I'm operating deeper in the body than 
any other operation that I can think of. It's a long way down. It is, isn't it? All the instruments are absolutely at the limits of, of what they can do. I thought with my longer hands that would help. Something bleed, I'm afraid. Not yet. Uh, we've got a bit of bleeding that's troublesome, so... Uh... Blood has always been described as a surgeon's worst enemy. Blood doesn't transmit light and you can't see through it. So as soon as there is any bleeding, then the operation grinds to a halt. And if the bleeding is substantial, the, the patient's life is put at risk. Well, I can see something going. He's absolutely correct. If there's a lot of bleeding, we can't see what we're doing. We can't complete the operation. So some patients, they bleed a lot more than others. There are certain medications that we typically stop before surgery so it doesn't increase their risk of bleeding. Bleeding can be very detrimental to patients. They can bleed really fast, they can bleed a lot, and patients can die from it. I have to be extremely meticulous to go through every site from which it might possibly be coming. Right, well, that's where it's dripping from. I think that looks like bacon. So what you're looking at here is the patient laying on their side and you see the lung that is in the view. So the structure that is moving up and down, that's the patient breathing, uh, their lungs inflating and deflating um, as they're working around this area. So we have to move the lung out of the way to actually get down to the spine. So that was irritating, wasn't it? You wonder what sets it off, don't you? You know, it's been sitting there quietly. The slightest movement, isn't it? We've got to get the disc mobilized. One of the things about operating on thoracic discs is that the most difficult part of the operation comes right at the end. Because it's effectively bone, it's still applying pressure to the spinal cord. And uh, I'm thinking, you know, I'm a millimetre here between wrecking him and removing the disc. And this is the part of the operation where your sphincter gets really tight. This is a very critical part of the operation. As he mentioned, this is a, there's a very fine balance between paralyzing this patient and removing that herniation. So this is where everything in the operation kind of seizes. People are talking, people are, music is playing, things in the background. 100% um, attention, meticulous attention to detail has to be made during this part of the operation. I often feel that I'm fighting with the last piece of disc material, that it is a, it's a battle of will between me and it. But of course it, it holds the upper hand because it knows that a false move on my part could have dire consequences. Come on, Colin. That's actually pretty big, isn't it? That's big. Oh. oh, dear. When I pull the tiny piece out of the deep dark... This is the moment, moment of the operation that, um, you know, is usually a big sigh in the operation operating room when we remove a portion of a tumor, cancer, or a large disc herniation. And that's a great feeling because you know that that part of the operation is over. Um, the next important thing is to just make sure that the patient can wake up and they can move their legs. That's the part that is really, um, can be really worrisome for a lot of surgeons just to make sure you didn't paralyze that patient. Of relief. And also there's a slightly comical feeling that I spent all day fiddling around removing this tiny piece of bone. How could it have caused so much trouble and taken so long? Hi right, Colin, how are you getting on? Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah good. good. How's your walking? Have you got a, some sticks? No, or I started, off, started off with one, but don't need it. 
Yeah. Show me. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Do you need a hand getting out? No, I'm fine. I'm good. Just take it easy, because we don't want you, fall, don't want you falling over at this stage. Yeah. Yeah. So a bit of foot drop still. Yeah. But, you know. That's very good. Yeah. That's pretty good. He's walking without any assistive devices like a cane or a walker, and he got up actually pretty good for, um, you know, after having a big operation like this. Uh, he's actually doing great, moving around um, really well. Um, uh, surgeon did a really good job of uh, decompressing his uh, spinal cord. No, I'm thrilled. Good. Yeah, thanks, thanks. We'll have to do it. <laughs> Take care. He's an amazing man. I just feel that I, the doors have opened on the rest of my life, really, and I can move forward. Yeah. Whereas before, I thought it's going to be a very difficult future. It's a new phase of my life. Thank you. <laughs> Did you want me to go and get your wheelchair or you have to try? No, I walked in and walk out. Well, right. I'll try. Bye bye. To. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye, thanks. Wow. Yeah, that, that was a really interesting case here. And it also highlights the the fact that, you know, we as surgeons, uh, we have the opportunity to change patients' lives. And patients can be very grateful um, um, you know, for the care that we provide to them. But there's also an element of uh, self-motivation on the patient's part that makes for a successful recovery also. So he was very optimistic kind of going into the surgery. The patient after surgery, I heard that he uh, declined any assistance with walking out, which I thought was a little dangerous. Most patients go out on a wheelchair, but uh, this just highlights the fact that uh, spine surgery can be very successful in patients that have really complex conditions. Patients on the verge of paralysis or weakness, being wheelchair bound, we could do operations that can help them recover and g gain mobility and function. So this is Dr. Webb. What are your guys' thoughts about this 11 hour spine surgery to save this patient from paralysis? Put it in the comments below. Make sure you also subscribe, like, hit that bell notification so you don't miss any new content that I have coming out. Thank you guys and we'll see you next time.